G'day guys, today we're going to talk about Anglo-Saxon Warfare. difficult to try and deduce military tactics purely from archaeology. Uh, we have to use a whole range of other evidence forms such as forensic archaeology. We need to use uh, contemporary evidence such as uh, the written records and so on. And that's primarily what we're using today to try and build an understanding of the Anglo-Saxon warfare styles. So we're referring to books like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation. The problem is, these books were not written for historians. So whilst these books might describe an event, and it might tell you the who and the where, and possibly the what, it doesn't really describe uh, necessarily very much else. So it might be, and a battle may simply be limited to two or three lines of text, which might say the battle of so and so occurred at this date, possibly the date, often just the year, and it might describe that King so and so took his army there, but we don't know how big the army was, we don't know how they fought, and we don't know necessarily what the strength of the enemy was. And these are really important factors from a historical point of view when we're trying to understand an event. So there's a whole bunch of assumptions that have to be built into this and those assumptions are based on evidence but that's actually really all they are is just assumptions. The next point is that there would have been a huge number of variations depending on whether you're uh, the type of fjord you're in, that is to say whether you're in a select fjord or the local fjord, or perhaps you're a hiskal. So there's different tactics and different methodologies here. We also need to look at the time period because the Anglo-Saxon warriors of the early period would have been incredibly different to those who fought 400 years later. And there would have been differences depending on whether you're fighting for an earl or a king or which earl or king you're fighting for. So again, the Anglo-Saxons of the earlier period tried to employ Roman army tactics that they would have learnt when they were mercenaries for the Romans or had perhaps looked at Roman techniques and, and, and tactics but were not necessarily able to employ them. Because a Roman legion was five and a half thousand soldiers so coupled with a Roman Auxiliary Legion, again, you'd be looking at 11,000 soldiers. Whereas the Fjord may just be um, fighting with, with 50 or 60 soldiers. So trying to employ big army tactics with just a few people isn't very uh, effective. There were essentially five stages of an Anglo-Saxon battle. In the first stage, it's called the Advance to Close Quarters. This is where the armies would face off there would be battle cries and insults. You would form your shield wall, bang and clash shields together, make a lot of noise and try and intimidate the other side. So when we think about this in a modern sense, you're looking at something like the New Zealand Haka. There would be an exchange of missiles in the second phase, that being javelins, rocks, arrows and axes. Because let's face it, if I'm in a shield wall, and suddenly my mate has one of these sticking out of his face, uh, that's pretty intimidating. In this third phase, you have the shield to shield. This is an incredibly personal, very close battle when you're facing off and basically you'll hack away at any piece that you possibly can. Uh, not just pieces of armor, but you'll hack flesh and you'll dismember bodies and it's a very personal, very up close and very disgusting way to fight. Uh, I spent 14 years in the military and even fighting from 200 meters away from people, it, it's still quite intimidating. But the key note here is you're fighting in a formation. 
And this is really important to understand because that's how weapons were actually employed. We're going to look at some of that specifically in some of the upcoming videos. The last stage of a battle was basically the route and pursuit. So this is where um, a shield wall may be broken with just the loss of perhaps 10 or 15 percent of the people. Once that shield wall has broken, then you're looking at a route and pursuit. The people being pursued would have been best advised to drop their weapons and helmets and demonstrate that they were no longer a threat and be willing to subjugate themselves to slavery. However, if you're looking at a pursuit, then that's when it becomes a slaughter and that was best described at the Battle of Stamford Bridge when the Anglo-Saxons pursued the, um, the Norse army. Unfortunately, we know incredibly little about how the Anglo-Saxons were able to maintain an army. In a relatively speaking modern context, for every single fighting soldier, there needs to be at least somewhere between three to five, and in more modern days, ten soldiers to support that one, sol that one fighting soldier. So the one infantry soldier is supported by up to ten others medics, drivers, cooks, all sorts of different radio operators and intelligence specialists and all kinds of different people. So an Anglo-Saxon army would have required all the logistics to be able to move it around, to be able to maintain it in the field, the blacksmiths, the weaponsmiths, the cooks and the, the, the wagon drivers and all kinds of in, in important people who would have comprised of the Anglo-Saxon army and unfortunately we don't know how this would have worked. We do know that Alfred the Great built a series, a network of burrs which were fortified villages and towns and these were in interconnected with roads and new roads, uh, Roman roads and new roads so he was able to move his army around with great speed. The other thing that we don't really understand is the level of training and the specific tactics and how that may have worked with the progression of the, the Anglo-Saxons during the period. We know that the Fjord was obligated to provide 30 to 40 days of service every year and that would have included maintaining bridges and spurs, not just fighting tactics. And we'll talk about some of these tactics a little bit later in some other upcoming videos. But there we go guys, that's Anglo-Saxon Warfare. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share and I'll catch you in my next video.